Silicon Slope Summit is Utah's original and longest-running grassroots tech event. It provides entrepreneurs, startups, and leaders the resources and community they need to succeed. With the pandemic behind us, we're excited to bring Silicon Slope Summit back to its original January dates in conjunction with the Sundance Film Festival. We have some unbelievable news. Silicon Slope Summit is free for all Utahns for the first time ever. You heard that right. Silicon Slope Summit is now free. For those looking for an upgraded experience, we are also offering VIP tickets for just $95. Thanks to our partners, sponsors, and government leaders, Silicon Slope Summit is the most accessible tech and startup event in the world. Summit will be hosted in multiple locations throughout the week in both Utah and Salt Lake Valley. There will also be a startup alley at Summit this year where startups and entrepreneurs can meet with investors from around the world to pitch their ideas, receive feedback, and promote what they're building. Of course, we'll be bringing in world-class leaders and speakers, as we have in the past, but we'll also be hosting specific tracks and bringing attendees together for curated networking in a way never done before. You don't want to miss this year's summit. To register, buy VIP tickets, learn about sponsorship, and apply for your startup to be part of Startup Alley Go to siliconslopes.com slash summit. How are things? How's Lindia? Good. Yeah? Yeah. You know, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a roller coaster. Um, yeah. Ever since like COVID for you, right? Yeah. Like it must have been, tell us what COVID did to Lindia. Well, first of all, before COVID, we were just, we were 22 months in a row hitting, hit our, our goals and our plan and just steady and consistent and growth. And, and then the world changed overnight for us. Every lender in America stopped lending. And so we were trying to figure out what does that mean? Uh, revenue goes to zero. And then uh, we start to hear about this uh, stimulation package, right? The, the CARES Act and, and how, there would be a paycheck protection program and every small business in America would actually be eligible for financing and believed that, um, you know, this was our moment. This yeah. was an art, like there was no one better positioned to be able to take advantage of, of like the software that we'd built in this platform to what we believed was save the American dream, like helping these small business owners who were, faced with, you know, getting their doors shut down and turning the lights off. Um, and so without even knowing how we were going to make money at it, we rallied and hired 250 people and decided to go, we jumped off the cliff and started building the plane on the way down and developing software and whatnot. And we flew really close to the sun. And, uh, but, um, I think I lost 10 years of my life, but it was probably the most meaningful thing that I'd done in my, my career. We ended up helping hundreds of thousands of small businesses. That is so crazy. Um, billions of dollars of capital. Um, and it was, it was incredible. It was an incredible ride. Um, but it was, it was like, there were so many amazing things to it, but also you make sacrifices along the way. It was like, we were, I can't, I always say we were driving down to, for those in Utah, driving down to St. George. And all of a sudden it was like, we got to go to Vernal. <laughs> we're going to take a hard left mm -hmm. and we're going to go way out into the desert and we're going to, you know, do a bunch of things. And then we got to backtrack and then we got to get back down to St. George again. And so once, once that pandemic, I'm skipping through a lot, but once that pandemic was over, it's like, okay, all the lenders are starting back over at zero again. And we, you know, revenue drops and, and now we got to, yeah. we got to climb out of the pit again. Um, as you were building, as you're going and just going nuts during COVID, were you thinking about post COVID where you're oh, like, no, oh, so what do we no, do I mean, here? It was survival mode, yeah. right? Yeah. Every minute of it. And, and the motivation was so much around small businesses and the impact. And I mean, every business in that, that we, we had so many small businesses that were dependent on us and so many that were friends and neighbors and family members and my mission president and all these people that were like, <laughs> I just felt so much pressure, yeah. more pressure than I've ever felt like that. If we let people down, you know, their business was going to fail and then they were going to be mad at us. And, and, um, in addition to just all, there was just, it was amazing. It was a lot. That time was so, I remember talking to you during that time. I think you were on a couple of our town halls. Yeah. 
I was like, I'm the, his life is so crazy. You know, you talk about for a while there, you talk about, oh, 20 hour days or whatever. And, and, but it's really not. Yeah. But this was legit that 20 was hour legit. days for, for about eight to 10 weeks at the beginning there. Was that building up the product and just f fine tuning? And you had to figure out what the heck the CARES Act was and how to implement it and what a PPP loan was yeah. and all that stuff. Everyone was figuring it out as we go. The problem was, is that the SBA would release or the you know Congress would release a new rule, a new way to look at it every single day if something was changing. And then they wanted you to be able to try and really stay compliant with that. And so, and we took that very seriously. Um, you know, there were a lot of players out there who didn't take it seriously. We didn't care about fraud checks and making sure that they're real businesses and doing all the controls and compliance and all of that. Yeah. And, and a lot of them have got a lot of investigations and been in trouble. Yeah. And, and there's that, and there was, there was a lot of fraud. Um, and you know, we, we, I had some, probably one of the things I'm most proud of is the, the amount of small businesses that we helped while also feeling very passionately that we did it the right way. We yeah. could have helped five times as much if we hadn't. Um, and so when you're every day, the rules are changing on you. That's what creates the, you know, the stress and anxiety and the frustrations. And yeah, yeah. you did the right thing though. Now you got to be, you know, who knows what your life would be like now if you just opened up the floodgates, no right? Question. And yeah. so to be able to be that super careful and to make sure that you were only helping legit businesses, that was the right approach. Regardless, there were a lot of money grabs during COVID. There were a lot of money grabs. COVID was yes. a lot of money grabs. <laughs> We've learned a lot yeah. about Americans, right? A lot of scammers uh, yeah. coming out of the woodwork. And also just, I mean, what did you learn working with these small businesses about their heart and their integrity and their willingness to go to work even when they're told they're not essential. Yeah. I mean, you see the, in a, in a crisis, you see the best of the best, um, attributes of just heroism and people. I mean, what you did at Silicon Slopes and the town halls, and, and there were so many people who had pure desires to make an impact and help others and just reach out. And I know we're struggling, but we're going to get through this together. So you see the best of the best. Um, and I was extremely inspired by, by so many during that time. And then you see the worst of the worst. Um, you yeah. know, it was, it was, <laughs> I remember posting, I, I, uh, I just remember seeing all the applications that we would catch that were fraudulent and they, and we ended up identifying like all these applications and they had to take a selfie of them, of a picture as part of their application submission. Mm -hmm. And we, we would show it's the same picture, like 10 different times on 10 different applications, same sweater, same drapes in the background with a different, you know, head that had been Photoshopped into it as part of this selfie picture. And I mean, just people that are trying to really take advantage of the situation. And, and, and a lot of them fortunately have been caught and then there's ramifications with that, but you know, it's, it, that, that part was just super sad and, and discouraging. Yeah. That's the weird thing about the PPP scams is like, that's pretty easy for the government to track down. Yeah, right? Most of it. Yeah. Especially, you know? I mean, you have, you have guys, people out there, you know, buying Lamborghinis and new houses and doing all of this just crazy stuff. They get their PPP loan and, and it's like, man, that's pretty trackable. You know, did you think we were better or worse in Utah? And you can be oh, honest. Utah. Utah by far better. Good. Yeah. Most, most of this, and I don't want to profile, but a lot from the South and, mm, and interesting. Florida and, and Georgia and, and other places. Um, the swing States. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Utah definitely like hit above our weight class. Like we always do. Uh, that's good to hear. That's yeah. way good to hear. Yeah. How do you focus on identity? Like I'm sure a lot of what your energy goes into, like, this is a real person. And how do you do that? Like what, what all goes into that? Are you using a lot of AI tools? I mean, and how are you doing it during the pandemic? Yeah. So, um, we, a lot of it, the responsibility was extended to us during the pandemic, um, because we were working with the lend. We had about 200 lenders that we worked with because we we're not a lender. We don't, 
actually fund the loans. We're not putting it on our balance sheet, but we were what's called a lender service provider, meaning mm-hmm. they were like, okay, you got the tech, you got the people, you've got the process. Let's work with you and we'll fund it, right? So we partner with lending institutions from that perspective. So we took on a lot more of that. And you use a combination of off the shelf tools that are just built for, you know, uh, identity verification Mm -hmm. with, um, you know, with a bunch of different checks. I mean, you're checking phone numbers, you're checking emails, you're verifying address, you're verifying the picture. Um, And then, and then the, there's OCR recognition, which basically goes and reads a tax return and to be able to determine has this been doctored in any way? There's a lot of technology that can help you read some of those documents. Um, and then there's there's some there's some human capital you use, right? To be able to do some of the make sense checks that may that are double checking things or spot checking things that that the technology can't do. Um, and we 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 hired a lot of people. Um, and um, it was amazing. Like we hired them all in temp. They, a lot of them had lost jobs at other positions and were oh, desperate for opportunities and all remote, and right? All of them remote. Yeah. That must and have been hard. On it was board. crazy. Onboarding 250 people in a remote setting in a few days was not something I, you know, wasn't on my bingo board for that year, but we, uh, but we did it and it was, it was incredible. Um, and, and, and the, the, the people that we hired, I never hadn't experienced this before. We got to the end of one of the programs and, and we were, we were notifying, I think it was about 60 to 70 people that unfortunately their temp position was coming to an end and they knew it mm. was coming to an end. And, and that meeting was like, you know, usually like if you're going to go tell people your, your job is not continuing, that's a very painful, <laughs> like stressful, sad. Yeah, and you aren't the, kidding. But the amount of like gratitude and, and thank yous and, and things that we got from those team members that, that we were telling them their position was not not continuing. It was just, oh, it was good. one of my favorite experiences ever. Um, but anyways, it, you do, you use every tool you get access to. Will it get harder or easier because of AI or is it sixes because the good guys and the bad guys both have AI and they'll be fighting against each other? Um, I don't know. A little bit of both, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. How are you using AI inside of Lendio? Yeah. So for us, it's a, uh, it's about customer inter- Like we have so much data on small businesses. We have a lot of customer interactions, phone calls, emails, texts. So all of that we can use to kind of drive a, an LLM to be able to kind of, uh, for customer interactions, to be able to answer yeah, questions. That's actually a lot, really interesting. A lot, of, a lot of things we can do around that, around the application process. Um, we, we are using, I, I wouldn't say AI specific. I don't know how some people put machine learning into AI. A lot of the way we do with our matching algorithm uh, is using machine learning. So essentially, let's say you're a business owner in Texas and you come in and you're applying for a hundred thousand dollar loan and, and you, you tell us all these attributes. I, I need it for this reason. And I'm buying equipment for my restaurant and I need it within the next three weeks. And here's what's important to me. Well, we will go and we'll evaluate the last 100 to 500 restaurants in Texas that look like your profile. And we'll see when they were matched up to a certain lender, what were the offers that they received, the rates and the terms. And when presented, let's say they were presented with all of these lender offers, which offers did they choose most frequently? Yeah. And then if we know, well, these 100 restaurant owners in Texas always chose this lender then we know, well, it's most likely that that lender and that loan product is the best product for that business owner. And that's using machine learning to be able to do that. So our system, our technology, like we're a marketplace, right? We're connecting this business owner to a lender. It becomes smarter and smarter as we're evaluating how the customer interacts with the lenders and their offers. So we use it in in that way as well. I think there's other applications um, as well, but uh, and some with marketing uh, services is easier. Um, but those are some of the ways. Mm. We haven't done any like co-pilot with engineering or anything like that yet. I think there's some there's some um, there's some hesitancy around that and and what happens to your data and some other things like that, but. Why aren't you a lender? 
I'm sure you've thought about it. Yeah, that's a great question. It, you know, everyone from day one has asked us, why are you not a lender? Because uh, we could be, I think, really easily. Um, what it comes down to is is um, enterprise value. Um, we, if you go and look and, and, and you study kind of enterprise value of an organization, you know, lenders are one to three X revenue. Um, marketplaces are four to six X revenue. SaaS businesses are seven to 12 X revenue. And, um, so much the marketplace for us is act one, and this is a three act play. So it took us a while to get this foundation bill, but now we're starting to get into act two, which is all SAS. And then act three will come later. And it's, um, and we believe this is a really big, we're sitting on a big opportunity and don't, and, and the lender aspect of it is I, we also don't want to compete with our lenders. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that, so, that would make it interesting. Your relationships with your current lenders, right. if you were in the mix of things. Right. And so they it's always like when were Amazon like, oh, you're just going to, yeah. you know, you're going to just figure all this out and then you're going to go lend it to yourselves. And we just keep telling them we're not, you know, for all these reasons, we're yeah. not, there's other, there's other aspirations at play that are more software related that I think being a lender would prevent us from, uh, chasing. You're one of the longest serving founders and CEOs in Utah. How long have you been doing this? Yeah. So you might so, be the longest. <laughs> I've been at it a long time. It's kind of interesting. With my co-founder, Trent Miskin. Yeah. Well, we started our, for the predecessor to Lendio was, was uh, funding universe. And that started in 2000, the end of 2005. So we're coming up on almost uh, 20 years. That's uh, incredible, man. Yeah. Lendio started, you know, we kind of pivoted the whole business to Lendio in 2011. So that's 13 years. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's, I don't know if it's stupid or if it's persistent or if it's, you know, it's all the different just descriptive words, but as long as we see, for me, I see like, there's an opportunity, a big one still that we're chasing. As long as I'm not bored, tired, don't see growth, whatever, we're going to chase it until there's, there'll be a harvest someday. Yeah. That's incredible. That's so cool. Um, I'm sure you get a lot of, like you were saying earlier, you get a lot of market research and a lot of data of what's going on in the country. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you um, lend outside the country, but particularly the United States. And when these job reports come out and they like, I think they inflated it like by a million or something. And then they just recently just said like, oh, actually it wasn't yeah. uh, as much. You probably have a better sense than they do of the state of the economy. Well, have you been seeing anything this year? We don't, we don't get to see, I mean, we have a really good pulse on Main Street America. And so Main Street America, they're not businesses that like, if it's a hundred employees or more, that they're not really interacting with us at, at Lendio. Um, so they're, the jobs report's going to evaluate all the jobs across every you mm -hmm. know size of company and all the tech jobs and all the you know, fortune 100 and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so what we get to be able to evaluate is main street. How's main street doing? Um, and what is the sentiment around main street? Um, and I think it's been, you know, it's been, it's been a challenge. Um, inflation has been really challenging on them. Uh, the, the, the costs of their supplies and tools and supply chain is, has really increased. It's really, uh, hit hard on their, their margins. Um, and so to be able to sustain that as it has been, uh, as they have done has been really, really impressive, uh, for mainstream America. Um, and I think right now there's a, a level of optimism that we haven't seen from them in, in a long time. Uh, we just did our own internal survey and, and, but I think business owners are always optimistic, but it seemed like they were more optimistic now than they have been. And I'm mm -hmm. not sure exactly what's driving that, to be honest, something I would love to dive a, a, a little bit deeper into, but, um, the last kind of year and a half has been a challenge, uh, because of the, the compression on yeah. their margins. Yeah. That the insights that you have are fascinating. Do you get asked to do like reports and like based off of like how small businesses are doing or do we do you a little those bit of, of that, things? a little bit of, of this, of the surveying, um, that for us is act three. So we're not pushing really hard on that. So we, we think about our business first is this, marketplace as our foundation. Everything is built. It's our differentiator. It starts there. Um, we're layering in it into it, these two growth engines that are two SaaS products. 
um, which I'm happy to talk about. But then act three for us is a data services play, which means we have more um, data on small businesses than about anyone in, in the U S because mm-hmm. every applicant that comes in, we get all of their financials, we get all their cash flow data, we get their credit data. So we know by industry, by geography, by uh, revenue size, by segment, by uh, just demographic, a lot of different data. Um, and we believe there's opportunity that, that to be able to start producing some of those reports, what is main, what's happening yeah. on main street. Right now, it's not a huge focus of, of ours, um, just because, you know, there's, we got plenty of other opportunity on yeah. our plate right now, but um, we know we've got the data, we're gathering the data, we're, yeah. you know, cleansing the data. We do some stuff with it, but not that much. So tell me about phase two. What are these two products? Yeah. So when you think about small business lending, um, you think about it, there's two sides of this. There's the supply side, which is the cap, the lenders providing capital. And then there's the demand side, which is borrowers seeking capital. And so we've, we just launched the beginning of this year, two products that, f- that will serve both the supply side and the demand side. So the demand side, we have um, what we call our embedded uh, marketplace. Um, so imagine uh, one of the partners we just landed, we've, we've landed recently partnerships with uh, Dun & Bradstreet, Lowe's, Paychex, H&R Block, these big brands that work with millions of small businesses. So imagine, uh, let's use Lowe's, for example, you've got a, a customer that goes to Lowe's all the time, Patty, the painter. Yeah. She goes there once a week to buy her tools, equipment, supplies, right? Imagine she logs into her Lowe's account and she sees, Hey, Patty, you're approved for $75,000. And she, cl- and, and she clicks on that and it's in all within Lowe's experience. And it already pre-populated her application because Lowe's already yeah. has all the information on her. And she gets three different offers there from lenders, lender A, B, and C. She gets $75,000. She didn't even have to apply for it. She, now she can use that money to be able to go and, and survive and thrive, right? That's so um, cool. And so our technology is like taking our marketplace and with a snippet of code, inserting it inside to Lowe's and Paychecks and H&R Block. And it, it, will, it allows us to um, attract millions of small business owners through these brands. That is incredible. Um, so we're really, really excited about it. Uh, the, the logos that we've landed in the first few months um, just shows we've struck a nerve. Like it's a, it's a big opportunity. Um, so that's, that's our first product. The second product is a product that we're selling to banks. Um, the problem with the challenge that banks have traditionally had is that it, a lot of applicants come are small businesses. They're, they're looking for loans for a hundred thousand or 200,000. They're not looking for a million dollar loan or whatever. The problem is, is that for a hundred thousand dollar loan, a bank is usually manual underwriting processes and they're using human capital and it's, it's laborious and it's slow and it's takes, it's costly. It's cost thousands and thousands of dollars for them to underwrite this loan. And so what banks have done is they're just like, oh, we're just going to neglect that customer. We're not going to really service them. We're going to do a million dollar loan because I it's going to cost me the same amount of money, but I'm going to make a lot more money. And so they've just moved upstream. So we've we've kind of felt this for for years and years and years that banks just aren't really servicing these small business owners. Um, and so our years of experience, what we've done is we've created a, an automated decision engine that looks at the the bank transaction data, the cash flow data of the business owner, we categorize that, put it into a profit and loss statement, and then we allow the bank to be able to basically apply their credit policy. Sorry, I'm talking oh, very lending. No, that's le- way le- interesting. Lending, no, no, legal. no, no. But um, it allows them to make an instant decision on a loan. Oh, wow. And so now a business owner could go to the bank's website and apply for a loan and on the spot get approved for a loan up to $250,000. Which is normally just a... Huge process. Just normally like six pain. weeks. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and so it's, um, the other cool thing we can do with the bank is we can, we can allow, let's say you bank at, where do you bank? Zions. Zions. Zions Bank. All right. Okay. So let's say we, we did a test with Zion. So let's say you're banking at Zions Bank, right? And you don't, you're not really applying for a loan. Um, but Zions, we have the ability for them to go evaluate your bank transaction data over the last 12 months. And, and be like, all right, well, Clint and Silicon Slopes, based on their transaction data, they're eligible for a $100,000 loan. And they could alert you 
Hmm. Um, on behalf of Zion, say, hey, Clint, I know you didn't apply for this, but here, you're already approved, $100,000. And so then now the customer's like, oh my gosh, my bank is amazing. It's taking good care of me and I can just, you know, accept the, the loan on the spot. And, and it allows Zions to really help their customers in a proactive way. Instead of just waiting until yeah. you go and apply, let's be proactive and let's help that, 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 that business owner get the loan that they need. And, and the idea there is that that loan amount opportunity just increases or decreases with you over time. Yeah. So maybe this month is a hundred thousand, but next month, you know, your cash flow is up and you're approved for 200,000 and the month after it goes down to 150. And so you can just always evaluate. You have that comfort in the back of your mind that I bank with Zions. I always know if I need something for an opportunity or marketing or buying equipment, I know I've got a hundred and whatever, 50,000 available that I can go draw on. That's um, incredible. So yeah, we, we're, we're providing that software to that banks to allow them to do that. What about like SBA loans? Have you figured out a way to make those faster? Yeah. So SBA loans, um, something I'm really proud of. So SBA has their process, mm -hmm. it's a government, long drawn out process. Um, on average, it's six weeks. So an SBA loan at Lendio right now on average is six days. Um, oh, wow. So we've cut it from weeks to days. Uh, I would venture to, to bet there isn't one, anyone that can do it faster than us. Um, I would love for it to be one day, but it's just, there's a lot of yeah. paperwork and documentation and things you have to abide by the SBA guidelines. Um, so six days is where we're at right now. How is the bank product going? Are you getting some good traction? Yeah, there? we're getting great traction. So we have, um, we did a pilot with Zions. It went really, really well. Um, we've got about five other banks on board. Um, CC Bank is one we've announced here mm. in, in Utah. Um, they're funding loans. Uh, we just announced a partnership with FIS. FIS is one of the largest, it's a $35 billion like bank software company. And they chose our decision engine as their like go to market decision engine. Um, we just announced that partnership. That was a big deal for us. This is a straight won. up SaaS company you've yeah. got going on now. Yeah. Super that excited must, about it. That's a different model for you, right? Yeah. So the, the way that this work, the, those three of those works, this is where it starts to get really fun. Is we talk about our Lendio flywheel is imagine now we've got this marketplace, right? Imagine now you've got Patty, the painter coming in and through uh, in Lowe's. And now one of the offers that Patty gets is from CC bank. So she's getting a instant offer from a traditional bank with low rates, you know, uh, great terms. Yeah. Um, and it happened in a matter of minutes. Um, and so now the bank's happy because they're getting customers from Lowe's. Lowe's is happy because they're offering bank products and it feeds our, it feeds the marketplace. Right. So they, it, it really is, it is SaaS, but it is this flywheel yeah. that, that turns that, that um, we're pretty excited about. How do you stay motivated? How do you keep going? Tell me what it average, because you look, you're phenomenal. You're like super fit. You look <laughs> way young. Like how are you, what's a typical day look like for you? Well, I mean, I think you, you have to be able to, I, I, I appreciate those compliments. It's very kind of you. Um, but I feel like if you don't take care of your body, you're not going to be sustained. Like you won't be able to, and, and there's a book out there called high performance habits, which basically says, like build these habits that you should be able to sustain over years, decades of your life. Um, and so for me, that's like, I was up at 4.45 this morning. I was playing, you know, a bunch of guys play competitive basketball in the morning. That's cool. You know, get my personal meditation study on um, and, uh, you know, and then go hit it hard uh, at the office and, and um, what time do you go to bed time. though? Uh, it's about 11. Uh, um, that's not enough time. 10, 10 30, 11. Yeah. So what do you got there? You got like about six and a half hours. You can do it with six and a half. I think I need seven. No, I, I think I need the seven. Sleep is important. I think it used to be where it's like, you feel really like, oh, I can do it in four hours. Or yeah, whatever. I'm not yeah. like that. Yeah, I, I used to be that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like brag about the, the, <laughs> The less sleep. And I don't, I'm not like that. I, I have found that if I'm getting six and a half, seven is, is a good thing for me. Yeah. Um, 
you know, other nights I get, I get eight on the weekend or something like yeah. that. But, um, you know, I just, I'm really motivated by a legacy. Like I want to, I want to make an impact on this world as well. You know, I want to build something that makes the world a better place. And I want to be able to go and follow in the the footsteps of a bunch of people here in Utah that are doing that now. Right. The yeah. Ryan Smith's and, and, uh, the Mitt Romney's and the Larry Miller's and the Gail Miller's and, and, you know, all, all these, um, people that, that are just really amazing inspirations to me. Um, and, uh, um, in my own way, I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm motivated by that. What have you learned about leadership being in a, the leadership position for this long? You know, when you, the minute you think you kind of figure it out, you don't, um, but I think it's, um, a few principles that stand out to me. Um, one is people really want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. They're super motivated by something that where you're, you're doing good and you're making an impact and it's mission driven. Um, I think that, um, when people feel that you care for them and they, they, they know that you're investing in them. Um, it's super motivating. They, they, they will, it drives, uh, changes when they bl- know that you care about them. It changes their thought process, which changes behavior, which changes outcomes. Um, and so I think really focusing on the individual, um, and not taking yourself too seriously. Like, yeah. Um, I think it's a big part of it. How do you like, I've got a lot to learn. How do you do like the life balance stuff? Like, how do you keep everybody happy in your life? (laughs) Balance (laughs) is not the right word. (laughs) What a crazy question. (laughs) Imagine if you had some sweet answer for that. (laughs) I mean, balance is not the right word. Um, Just, I don't know. You do your best. You you know, you got to sacrifice things. You got to figure out what are your priorities in life. Um, you can't do everything. And so there's a lot of things that are important to other people that aren't, aren't important to me and and vice versa. Yeah. And so you just, I think it's really important to be able to say, okay, what are the things that are the most meaningful to me and how do I make time for that? And then that means other things that are less important are going to fall off. And, um, and so I think figuring that out, what is it that makes you tick and what that brings you satisfaction and brings you peace and brings you joy and, um, like really being honest, intellectually honest with yourself and then just chasing after those things as hard as you can and as relentlessly as you can. Yeah. How do you think Utah's doing it overall? Utah's such a special place. Um, the, 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 the community, um, is a really, really big part of that. The way people, I mean, you've got this you know, the, the government sector, the private sector, the public sector, the, the, um, I mean it, the way that the quality of life, um, the talent, this pioneer spirit of entrepreneurship and striving to, to kind of punch above our weight class, the way that people, when they have success, they turn around and they want to help the next person in a sincere way. Um, the regulatory environment, um, you know, it's, there's just so much that's special about Utah. I'm, I feel very fortunate to be a part of it. I know it, it really is a pretty special place. We have our challenges for sure, but yeah, no yeah, question. It's a special place. Finally, we end every interview with this question. Are you ready? At Seal Consults, we believe the chances one gives is just as important as the chances one takes. When you hear that, who gave you a chance to get you to where you are today? Yeah. I mean, I think about, um, I think about Alan Hall, um, who's a pioneer here in Utah. Absolutely. Um, what a legend Alan Hall is. <laughs> he, he, he took a bet on, on, on me when a lot of people wouldn't, I'd think about Greg Warnock and Greg Warnock has, um, has had a bad rap, uh, especially as of late. I think a lot of that is very unjustified and actually are, um, unjustified. Uh, yeah. accusations. Um, I feel for him and I know he's, um, anyways, he, he's backed me when others haven't. Um, Mark Solon was a guy from highway 12 ventures in, in Boise, Idaho. 
And we were looking to raise our first round and they were debating whether they were going to lead it or not. And, and they were going to make a decision the next day in their partner meeting. And I'm like, I got to figure out how to influence this. And I got on a plane just last second. I showed up at their partner meeting and, and I'm like, listen, I don't know if Lendio at its current stage is worth betting on, but Trent and, and I, I hope that you'll see that Trent and I are worth betting on. And he took that bet and that meant a lot to me. That's cool. Um, and, uh, so those are some of the people that, um, I'd say, and my, my business partner, Trent Miskin, he's kind of behind the scenes and under the radar, but just brilliant, brilliant guy, problem solver, loyal, honest, hardworking, just, um, a great, amazing business partner for me. You guys have lasted longer than most marriages. <laughs> That's true. It's pretty incredible. It is. It really is. And you know, you have your ups and downs, but I'm grateful for him. Rock, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Clay.